Yeah, well, since we're on the topic yeah. of Paul, real quick, was he uh, was he indeed a disciple of Gamaliel? I mean, they, I think it says um, this. This question is a little out of order, but since it's on topic, I'll just kind of throw it out there. It said, um, "Was Saul of Tarsus really was a student of uh, well, Rabbi uh, Gamaliel? Uh, how likely was it the Roman citizens hired? This is this is a conspiracy theory that I saw that uh, they've have videos on that that actually kind of makes a little bit of sense. But she's kind of curious if uh, this is Deborah Lee from Facebook. Kind of curious uh, what kind of jurisdiction did the high priest have over Damascus? Um, that whole package there has got so many plausible answers. Um, so All right. So <laughs> let me, this is a very, very good question. And sorry, I'll I will get to the rest of the questions, but it was on topic and I figured it'd be best to hit it now. So I'll get to the, we have got other questions we're going to address. So don't this, worry, hang in this there. This is big. This, this is, is big. not something that we glossed over at all. <laughs> it should be said, first of all, that Christians or former Christians, it's not their fault. But they, you know, they have all this information about Paul, either from Acts, or they're getting it from other epistles, or then certainly getting it from Paul. But what people who come from the church tend to do is they kind of conflate it all. Like somehow Paul claimed to be a student of Gumwheel. He actually never would make that claim for himself. If he did, he would be laughed out of court in a second. The letters of Paul are written during the 50s. The book of Acts is written, like, let's say, at about 90, 85, 90. It's very, very late. By the time we get to 90, you can write anything you want. So Paul Nobody can never makes it. Paul is, Paul, there's a reason why. Now, if Paul was a disciple of Rabbi Gamliel. By the way, I am a descendant of Rabbi Gamliel. I am hmm. not father, but my great-grandmother was a descendant of Rabbi Gamliel, who was from the house of David. I am. Okay, Paul was not a descendant of Rabbi Gamaliel. He wasn't a member of the Sanhedrin. This is all nonsense. And it, it's very transparent that this could not be the case. Now, I'll explain to you why he couldn't. He could, I mean, he will claim I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I'm the biggest Pharisee. I know there were Pharisees, but you don't like me. I'm such a Pharisee. You never heard of such a... <laughs> so... It, he could not be a disciple of Gamaliel for a thousand reasons. Let me go through why this is all patent nonsense. Um, to begin with, Paul, we are told that Paul went to Damascus at the behest of the high priest to persecute Christians in Damascus. And along the way, we are we the claim is made that Paul had this, these encounters, these supernatural encounters with Jesus, and he converts. Uh, to Christianity. We're just going to use the word converts to Christianity because it's, you know, I don't want anyone writing he didn't convert, he was doing it. Stop, okay? We're going to use <laughs> words that were, that are just easy to work with. So th the point is hold the show. Who were the high priests in the time of Paul? Who, who controlled the priesthood? As it turns out, they were Sadducees. Sadducees were an elite group that were in cahoots with Rome that very much controlled the priesthood. They were enemies of the Pharisees. They were, they were at war, spiritual war with the Pharisees. And therefore, would they, I mean, just think about this for a moment. Why would, they, why would a, if Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, if that's the school he came from, which he does claim for himself, if, if he was what Acts says, that he was a student of Gamaliel, what is he doing working for a Sadducee? I mean, that's totally ridiculous. Number two, do you understand? I mean, that, like, why, that's like, like saying that uh, uh, the chief rabbi is working for the messianic movement. Hmm. I mean, that's like ridiculous. I mean, that's just, that just, <laughs> that could not happen. Number two is the high priest would have no jurisdiction over what's going on in, in Syria. I mean, that's just patently ridiculous. Third thing is that the attitude of the Pharisees were not in any way threatened by Christians. That means they didn't want to kill Christians or harm them or persecute them. And in fact, this is even revealed in the Christian Bible. Think for a moment. If we go to Acts chapter 5, what do we encounter there? Peter is brought in front of Gamaliel, who we are told, who we are told was the um, the teacher of Paul. What is what is Gamaliel's attitude? I mean, if we are to believe that 
Paul was a disciple of Gamliel and followed the teachings of Gamliel, let's just that that would that could not be because he would be a Tana, he'd be listening in the, he would listen to Mishnah. He isn't, he wasn't, that never happened. But let's just play make believe and let's go along with the story. What was the attitude of the Pharisees? The attitude of the Pharisees was very simple. Gamliel says in the book of Acts, he says, look, don't harm Peter. Don't do anything to him. Why? Because if, remember, Peter in this early point is sort of teaching a, a Christianity, is a follower of Jesus, but he's still keeping kosher, keeping everything Jewish. So Gamliel, we are told, tells him that, hey, don't, tells the those who brought Peter to Gamaliel, don't don't hurt him. Don't even try to stop him. Don't do anything to impede him. Don't persecute him. Leave him alone. God will take care of it. You know why? Because if what Peter is teaching is of God, hurting Peter is is going to accomplish nothing. And if it's not of God, it will in fact uh, it recede. It will simply dissipate. It will evaporate. That was the attitude of the Pharisees. The attitude of the Pharisees was, you don't, you don't need to persecute Christians. Mm -hmm. Just teach them. Just like, you know, all of Pharisee Judaism, which is Orthodox Judaism, don't don't go and persecute people because they don't keep Shabbos. They don't know any better. Did they come on the influences of? of liberal Jewish groups or whatever, whatever it is, love them, not beat them over the head. <laughs> so therefore, think about this for a moment. If in fact Paul came from the Velk Ansham, from the world view of Rabbi Gamliel, what was he doing going to Damascus to persecute Christians? The attitude of Rabbi Gamliel is don't persecute Christians. Now, as it turns out, Rabbi Gamaliel's statement, in fact, was in fact prophetic in a strange way. Because what happened was that Peter's understanding of Christianity, again, this is before we're getting to um, Acts chapter 10, before Acts 15, was that you could be Jewish, you can keep the Torah, you can keep the mitzvahs, but you can believe in Jesus, you know, that they can all go together. And Rabbi Gamaliel says, that can't happen, that can never be, because it, the, the Bible tells us, and this is not next, that not all Jews remain a part of the Jewish people, only those Jews who are faithful to God's teaching as truth. You find this in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, verse 12. The point is that only the truly faithful servant of God is preserved. Let's be frank. Many Jews, thousands converted to Christianity, got baptized. Where are the children of these Jews today? They're lost. They've assimilated. If Jesus was the Messiah, if Jesus everything that your church says he was, then why did God preserve only those Jews who said that Jesus is not the Messiah, that rejected the claims of the church, that rejected the... Why did God, if there's no oral Torah, why didn't God preserve the Sadducees? They're gone. They disappeared. Mm -hmm. So what Gamliel is saying is, you don't have to work, work, you don't have to do... This is God's department. He'll take care of this. And in fact... That understanding of Christianity, which has long, they lost, they, they, they're gone, in fact, disappeared. You will, of course, encounter Jews today who believe in Jesus, but they're not the descendants of those Jewish Christians, whatever name you want to call them sure. from, the, from the time of things. So therefore, all this is absolute nonsense. He wouldn't be a member of the Sanhedrin. He wouldn't be persecuting. Why would he do persecuting Christians in Damascus, mm -hmm. Gamaliel, and this type of outlook is don't persecute them. If it's not of God, it will fall away of its own, which in fact happened. Besides the fact, what is he doing in, from Tarsus? And if you read Paul's letters in Greek, let's just say this, it's very simple. Greek, Paul was a highly literate Greek-speaking Christian. Okay, um, Jews from Jerusalem, Jews who were members of the Sanhedrin, Greek wasn't just another language. Greek was like German. 
Greek was the language of the Hellenists. It was the, the language of all those who are enemies of God. Uh, just so you understand, those of you who are English speakers, it's not a simple matter to write in just writing because you're literate in English. I'm speaking to you Americans. So you're literate in English. You say, I speak English. But I'll ask you honestly, could, would you be able to write a, 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 a highly literate rhetorical book of 16, of, of 10 chapters, of 13 chapters in English, well-written? The answer is probably not. It'll be very difficult. You have to be highly literate to be able to write that way. So that's not where Paul comes from. In fact, it's interesting that Jerome, a very important church father, much later the primary or translator of the Vulgate, also casts doubt on Paul's uh, origins from Tarsus. Tarsus is one of the two places that was the was the center for Greek philosophy and thought. Mm. It was that's like, you know, that's like Berkeley. I mean, that's like, <laughs> that's not where, you know, religious Jews are from. So therefore, Paul wasn't a Pharisee. A Pharisee, that's why he emphasizes it. Why is he emphasizing? Because he's pushing back at the, at the accusation that, you know, he was some sort of a Pharisee. So he wouldn't be working for the high priest. He wouldn't be, a Pharisee is not working for Sadducees. That ain't happening anywhere, okay? Mm -hmm. That's like mm -hmm. saying a Lubavitcher is working for a Karite or a, a, uh, a, a, a religious Jew is working for, I, I, I don't know what, for the Messianic. That's just not <laughs> happening. Two is the attitude of the Pharisees was, why persecute anyone? Well, could make the case that maybe Sadducees might feel very threatened by the um, by the Christian movement because they were in cahoots with Rome, so therefore they would find it to be very threatening because they their position of power came from Rome in any kind of movement that said that uh, Rome's kingdom was coming down, uh, they would have felt threatened, not Pharisees. So therefore, the notion that Paul was a Pharisee is, is object nonsense. The idea that Paul went to Damascus to persecute Christians, why would a Pharisee be interested in doing that? I mean, I'm a Pharisee. I don't persecute Christians. I just say, let me teach you, tell you, come, listen, let's study scripture together. Come, let's reason together. That's why this is all complete nonsense. I mean, also, Paul's exegesis, I mean, if he was really knowledgeable, he was really an evil charlatan. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, but if he really was what he says he was, which is impossible, then he really was a psycho because that means he knows. I mean, he's like a Holocaust denier, and he, mm -hmm. he knows. So I'm just going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he was an object ignoramus. Um, as far as uh, Jerome uh, was concerned, Jerome suspected that Paul was not from Tarsus, but rather from Galilee, but that mm. goes on to a different area. So that's... Was know, that's there, a, was there a possibility that a Roman citizen could have uh, hired the Sanhedrin yeah, again, there, vice Paul versa? to be a Roman citizen is extremely unlikely in order to be a Roman citizen. You would have to be worshipping the gods of Rome. Again, extremely unlikely. Mm. Again, I'm not going to say, you know, group, but this is a, these are very unlikely um, claims made for Paul. I, but I, I don't want to engage in this part. Sure, he sure. Just, we, we, I don't want to cross into the speculative part. I just want to look at okay. the text. Uh, Paul is not working for Jews for Jesus. Well, I, I don't mean <laughs> Jews for Jesus. Paul <laughs> isn't working for the, you know, there's this like denomination uh, you wouldn't believe it called humanistic Judaism. Mm -hmm. They don't even believe in God. They actually, the reform movement said that you can't even belong to the reform movement because they they don't even have a Torah scroll in their synagogue, okay? So, I mean, I mean to claim that Paul is a, 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 a Pharisee is working on behalf of, you know, I don't know the care rights. That this is just absolutely well, preposterous. I, I I agree there, and I, I may have not have asked the the second part of the question right. In fact, I know I didn't. I think I got them backwards. How likely was it that a Roman citizen hired by the Sanhedrin to be their policeman? In other words, how likely was it? Is it was it a possibility even that you know that Paul was actually hired by the Sanhedrin to 
uh, to do whatever he wanted, whether it be lead those Christians away to kind of as a decoy or. No, uh, no, no, that didn't happen. Okay. You, you read Paul. Paul is, when I say sincere, he was very committed to destroying everything, uh, any vestige of traditional Judaism. Uh, what was his motives is not really relevant to the Jews. We, we don't get into this too much. You'd have to speculate. But Paul was a person who he was deeply influenced by Hellenistic thinking. I can't get into the, the scope of this becomes too large. And he is taking many of the ideas that Philo uh, had expressed. Philo was a contemporary of Jesus, he was a Jew from North Africa, from Alexandria, and visited the land of Israel a number of times. And that, that's, that's what Paul's influence is. And again, this kind of Greek influence, this it, it, Tarsus is the city you would live in if you wanted to study, if this is the kind of, if this, if this is what you wanted to study. Mm. So this is, you know, very unlikely, but I'm going to try to just stick with what the text says. Sure. No Pharisee is going to Damascus. He's not working for anybody, for any high priest. He's not working for any any Sadducee. High priest had no no jurisdiction whatsoever what went on in Syria. They're not what is he gonna pursue? How ridiculous is that? So therefore that just never happened. These are stories that developed and were created and we're you know gonna find in, in the book of Acts. Now, why is are we presented that Paul was an enemy of or, you know, an enemy of, of Christianity, then he became a believer. Well, the, that we understand why Paul is going to spend so much time on, and that is that it was to lend credibility to him. You know, there's a there's a uh, a professor from MIT, very brilliant man. Uh, his name is Noam Shamsky. Noam Shamsky is one of the greatest enemies of the state of Israel today. He's an mm -hmm. enemy of. I mean, what am I going to say? You don't know this now. You know Noam Shamsky. You know how he begins his speeches. He talks. He talks about growing up in Philadelphia and uh, giving money to you know to, to the Zionism and putting money in the Pushka, which is the charity box. And you know when Norman Finkelstein, another one of our great friends, uh, a, a, a Jew by birth, only by birth. He what does he do? He starts by saying, "Oh, I used to be the other way, and I used to my parents are how." Holocaust survivors and so on and so forth. There's a professor, I don't know if he's still there from Northwestern University. His name is Arthur Butts. He's a Holocaust denier, Arthur R. Butts. He's a professor of, of computer engineering at Northwestern. I think he retired. I'm not I'm not certain of that. You know, he they all these Holocaust deniers, David Irving, when these guys get up, the way their speeches, they all start the exact same way. You know, when I was a kid, I used to believe, you know, that there were six million Jews that were murdered. I mean, go on YouTube and watch any of their presentations of the deniers. They always started by saying, oh, no, I used to be on the other side. I used to believe that six million Jews were systematically murdered in Europe during World War II. I believe that. There was a Jew named David Cole who actually was a Holocaust deniers. That was the speech he gave. So, therefore, it, it, it sounds more credible to say, hey, I used to be on the other side, but guess what? I found out the truth. So therefore, that kind of rhetoric is um, is in is always been a part of those of the enemies of Israel. I used to be on the other side, but then I discovered the truth. There was no systematic um, uh, ex uh, extermination of the Jewish people. And David Irving, actually, at the University of Colorado, had the chutzpah and audacity to say in his presentation, going back a number of years ago, to say that you Jews should thank me for saying that the Holocaust, the genocide, never occurred in Timothy mm -hmm. because you thought you lost six million Jews. Now you should know that you really didn't, and everybody's doing fine.